So a couple years ago, we sat down as an elder board and, and we, we talked about the, the things that we wanted to be true of Susquehanna Valley Church in, in 15 years. And called it In 15. We did this uh, discussion for a number of, of weeks back and forth about what, what are the things that we want to be true of us in 15 years. Uh, and the idea of that was if it's going to be true of us in 15 years, it's not going to accidentally happen. We're not going to end up being a church that's really involved in the community, has a really good kids ministry program, really good student ministry program. It's not just going to happen. We have to be intentional about it. And so we, we backed up and said, well, how do we get there? We create a culture that values the things that we want to see happen. And so, so we came up with these different value statements that you'll hear us say from time to time. We're a source of grace, not drama. Or uh, we're a rock solid. We have a rock solid dependence on God. I just want to highlight two of them because there, there's opportunities for us to sort of live them out really, really well coming up. Um, and opportunities that we're passionate about as a staff. And I think um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to be who we want to be. And so the first value is, is that everyone's invited. That we want to be a church that welcomes people from all sorts of backgrounds. If a person is of the perspective that, that they couldn't come to a church because of what they've done or where they've been, that's the type of person we want them to know deeply that God loves them and that this can be a home for them. And so we've got an opportunity coming up with, with the uh, outdoor pantry where we're going to love some people who, who by all means have, have kind of shut themselves off feeling like they don't deserve God's love or, or they've just been through so much in life that they can't imagine that God would love them. The outdoor pantry where we're going to give food to those in need is an opportunity for us to say there can be a home for you at Susquehanna Valley Church. There's a God who hasn't given up on you. There's a God who loves you. And, and this little token of giving you food is just an example of our love for you. And so we need volunteers for that. That's next Sunday right after church, 12 o'clock to 1.30. We're going to go over to Lingle Park. Um, and we would love for you to sign up. There's different places you can sign, different, different things you can sign up for. Um, and, and that's in the Church Center app. Or you can just come up to me and I can help you sign up or or one of the other staff members, we can get you signed up. It's an opportunity for us to be the church that we want to be. If we want to have an impact on the community in 15 years, we've got to get out in the community right now. So that's next Sunday right after church. Um, I, I was reading this week in my personal devotions about the time when, when the, the mission of the church kind of shifted from initially being towards trying to reach those in Jerusalem to, to the Gentile, to the non-Jewish people. And there's this discussion between Paul and Peter and the other, the other apostles, and they're, they're kind of going back and forth about what this, this new thing is going to look like. And Peter says, look, all I ask is that as you go on this new uncharted territory, all I ask is that you remember the poor. Because it was central to the heart of Jesus Christ. So let's let it be central to our hearts and make sure that we know those who are underprivileged are people who are invited, who are loved, who are welcomed. So that's next Sunday after church. The other thing is, uh, and the other value I wanted to highlight is we have a passion and an obligation for the next generation. That the church after us is just as important as the church right now, if not more important, that if we want Susquehanna Valley Church to be a church, not just in 15, but in 30 years, we've got to raise up a generation of kids who are passionate about Jesus Christ. And so we do things not just with our kids, but we do things in the community as well. We've got the Easter egg hunt. And, uh, and there are a number of opportunities for you to volunteer to come out and, and be part of a day where we're going to minister to hundreds of little kids to help them have a great time. And we're going to love them well. And we're going to invite them to, to, to come back to more that we're doing here. Um, and so that's, that's going to be April 3rd. That's a Saturday between Good Friday and, and Easter Sunday. And so we would love to have you come out and demonstrate our passion and obligation for the next generation. Uh, one of the things that you can sign up for is to be a hair dye person. And look, some of you, no names, don't have any hair. So you can live out your dream of dyeing hair on somebody else. Just like a spray paint kind of hair dye. Uh, no, it, it's going to be it's going to be a great time for us to love kids. Speaking of kids, I, I've noticed over the years a change in mine, where um, they, they have this desire to prank me as their father, and and honestly, like their pranks are like, let's put, and it always happens to be so I can hear them. 
Like, but they're like, let's put sugar in dad's milk. And I'm like, that's, wow, that's a good one, guys. Slow down. Dad's going to gain a half a pound over the next 20 years. Or, or, or they'll be like, let's, let's hide his toothpaste. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to just use another toothpaste. Like, but so last night we're driving, and I hear them in the back seat, and they're talking. And one of them says, let's put super glue on the toilet seat. <laughs> okay. Now that's something. Now that, that's a thing where if it happens, it's like it's a big deal. And so I realized, like, huh, like now we're in, we're in like actual alert status where I've got to be aware that I might sit down and not get back up. Okay, so we got to pay attention here. Look, so, so what we've been doing in this series, this Go and Leave series, is, is we're, we're raising alert status. Like when scripture talks about sin, it's not like this has no effect on you. This is inconsequential. No, like the, the, Jesus raises the alert status. Like this is legitimate stuff. It's going to drain your life. It's, it's destructive to your relationships. It's opposite of what God desires. Raise the alert status. And we've been looking at it through the story of this woman caught in adultery and Jesus has these words to her, neither do I condemn you. But then he says, go now and leave your life of sin. And what we've done in the series is actually worked backwards through that statement. Go now and leave your life of sin. So we started with sin, and we said, what, what is it? How is this draining? How is this experience of death and life? And then, and then leave. And last week we talked about this idea of, uh, of God brings life and sin brings death. And so you count yourself dead to the death part of it. You believe that Jesus has rendered that powerless in your life. And we talked about confession as an act of leaving it. And today I want to talk about the go side of it. Jesus wasn't just telling her to get away. He wasn't just telling her to, to, to leave. He, he was doing something more than that. When he says go, he uses a word that, that it would be like, you, you're, you know when they, they announce like a high school football team and they let them run out of the field and they have that big sheet of paper and they run through it to go out on the field. That, that's the word go is run through. To leave one place and enter another. To let one thing be behind you and, and go run towards something else. It's, it's about a change in location that she would leave, in this case, leave a life of sin and go towards something new. The biblical word for this, and we're going to read it in a scripture in just a minute, is the word repent. Repent is this idea that one thing used to be pleasing and one thing used to be good, but now it's not anymore and you turn away from it and you run towards something else. So, so, so what do we run towards? What did Jesus tell this woman to, to not just leave, but to go to? I believe it's that that Jesus wanted her to leave a self-centered pursuit, to leave a life that, even if it might have been about pleasing everybody else on the surface, was underneath, at the core, pleasing herself. To leave that sort of lifestyle and to, and to pursue a God-centered existence where we're going to love God and we're going to love people from the biblical framework of what love is, and we're going to do that well. It's not going to be about me. It's going to be about the opportunity for me to love others. And for Jesus, the penultimate expression of love is to help somebody find a relationship with Jesus Christ, with him. To be forgiven of their sins, to find their home in him, to be loved as God himself can only fully love. And so I want us to look at that mission this morning. We're going to look at it in this interaction where Jesus has with, with those who were the religious authority and look down on others to feel better about themselves. And, and Jesus is going to challenge them with something that I believe is also by default a challenge to, to us this morning. So Luke 15 and verse 1 it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, let's just stop there because you have to understand that these people groups that are involved here because you've got Jesus, then you've got the religious leaders, then you've got the tax collectors and the sinners. The, the religious leaders taught a lot, but they never had the audience that Jesus had. 
They never had the tax collectors and the sinners around them. It wasn't a thing. They weren't welcomed there. They, they, we started this series out talking about no moral high ground where sin is never an opportunity for you. To, when, you when you leave sin, it's never an opportunity for you to look down on somebody else who hasn't. This was them. This was a religious elitist mentality. And they're there and they're thinking, I can't believe that Jesus would welcome such a crowd. You see this sort of language in so many of the scenes where Jesus has these crowds around. And people are saying, if Jesus knew what sort of woman that was. Right? You see this sort of elitist mentality. And, and here are the two groups, the, the tax collectors. The tax collectors, they, I mean, they were hated. They were people of Jewish nationality who bid on an opportunity to, to be the tax collector. And when they became the tax collector, because they already had to put all the money out, they raised their prices to line their pockets. In fact, they were so despised, if a tax collector saw somebody get murdered and he was the only witness, the tax collector's testimony wouldn't be allowed to stand because he was a tax collector. They were deemed to be so dishonest that they had no testimony in a courtroom. And that sinners, sinners were those who had been written off. It wasn't just those who had, had done something wrong. In, in their minds, in the minds of this elite group, the sinners were those who, because of their lifestyle, had forfeited an opportunity to be loved by God. They forfeited it. And so the religious elite are sitting there going, are you kidding me? Why, why are you wasting your time, Jesus? These people are not only, it's not only a waste of your time, but they, they couldn't possibly be loved by God. And Jesus wants them to know something entirely different about what is central to his, as the Son of God, to his kingdom. He tells them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Let's pray. God, we've mentioned a couple times this morning about the community and those in the community being able to find a home here. Lord, I pray this text, this scripture, this parable finds a home in our hearts. That this would define our greatest sense of why we're alive. That this would shape every conversation we have. Every interaction with every neighbor would be run through this parable. That we would see the world through the lens of your great passion for those who are lost. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I mentioned you, you've got the, the religious leaders here. To, to them, th this was like a problem scene. I mean, they, would, they, they wanted to kick them out. Can't believe it. This, they're muttering amongst themselves. Can't believe Jesus is here. Because for them... For them, Jesus being associated with them meant he affirmed their behavior. That Jesus simply being near them meant that he must have approved of the tax collector's dishonesty. He must have approved of the sinner's lifestyle. And so there's this, just this deep, deep hatred towards not just them, but towards Jesus. Because in their mentality was that, that if you hung around people who had something wrong with them, there had to be something wrong with you. And Jesus, he doesn't operate that way. For him, it's not that his association affirms their behavior. For him, it's that his association affirms their value. That they matter to him. They matter to God no matter how far gone they run. He's still willing to run after them. And so he tells this incredibly powerful, passionate parable of, of a savior, of a shepherd who, who goes out looking for a sheep that's been lost. 
And see, this happened often enough in their society that this would have been a thing that they knew about. The shepherd would often move a flock from one place to another, and it wasn't uncommon for, for a sheep to kind of, that, that was maybe a little bit weaker, to straggle behind and get, get left. And as the shepherd's leading, and then all of a sudden he gets to the place where he's going, and he, he thinks, oh no, we're down one. Where, where is it? They've got to look out for animals and predators that could attack, or maybe it just was laying somewhere in the desert. And, and so the shepherd runs and looks with this persistence until he finds it. And then the scene is one of just incredible care. I mean, you think about it, he carries the sheep. Why? Because the implication was that it was left behind because it, it was weak and it, it couldn't, couldn't keep up. And so So Jesus puts it on his shoulders and carries it back. And then the scene is the scene of this incredible rejoicing. Daryl Bach writes about this in his commentary. He says, even though the shepherd pictures God's desire, disciples, the followers of Jesus, are to share his attitude. That this isn't just his heart. This is his value system. This is his culture that he's shaping. And so we're here to help locate lost sheep. We're here that that's our adventure in life. That's what we're called to. This is our prerogative. I loved, uh, I loved reading the book The Hobbit. Uh, I just read it not long ago to my kids, and I love The Hobbit. If you're not familiar with it, let me give you a little bit of the back story. It's written by J.R. Tolkien, and he, uh, he tells a story. It's really written primarily about this one particular hobbit, but a hobbit is like this this. I, don't, I guess it would be a person that's like half our height, doesn't have a beard, so I am disqualified from hobbit status. Uh, but hobbits, hobbits were, were known uh, for, for particularly being very well off, and they lived in these little tiny hobbit holes that were very safe and very luxurious. And really, the greatest wonder of a hobbit was whether he was going to have not just first dinner, but second dinner. And what was he going to have for second dinner? And that was his big problem in life. Uh, and, and so really what we see here is in as Tolkien kind of lays this out in the beginning, he describes the hobbits, he describes particularly Bilbo Baggins that the story centers around. He says, most people considered him very respectable, not only because of how rich he was, but also because they never had any adventures or did anything unexpected. And there's a sense where to be a hobbit meant that you valued everything just going smoothly. You valued a life of comfort. You valued a life of luxury and of safety. Until the story goes where, where, where something changes and, and Gandalf, the great wise wizard, enters the scene and, and presents Bilbo with the opportunity for an adventure. And Bilbo responds, no, thank you. We don't want any adventures here today. No, thank you. You can be gone. No adventures here. The idea of, a, of adventure is just so, so foreign to him in his world of, of everything being set and everything being understood and being certain. The Hobbit is really this sort of rare story of a Hobbit who goes on an adventure. And it, it, it really begins to awaken when, when Gandalf almost, he really tricks him into an adventure. It's a fascinating story. He tricks him into an adventure. And, and at the beginning of this adventure, you see this reference to the sort of lineage of, of Bilbo Baggins. There's the Baggins side, which is pure hobbit, 100%, never wants to do anything that would take any sort of risk. And then there's the, the, his mother's side, the Took side. The Took side is the side which has this odd, for, for a hobbit, this odd sort of desire for adventure. And as the story goes on, you see this battle back and forth of which side is going to win, the side of, uh, of Hobbit, the side of Baggins, which is, is going to prefer safety and, and certainty, or is it the Took side, which, which wants this sort of wild, courageous adventure in life? In the beginning, you, you see this played out where Tolkien writes that then something Tookish, the mother's adventure side, then something Tookish woke up inside of him. And he wished to go and see great mountains and to hear the pine trees and the waterfalls and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. There's part of him that deep down wanted life to not just be safe and comfortable. There's part of him that longed for this sort of adventure. And Tolkien, writing from a Christian perspective, underlying much of the Christian faith, understands that within each one of us, 
Those two sides exist. The sort of Baggins side, which wants everything to be safe and convenient, wants everything to go just as we had planned. And then, then there's this other side, the, the took side. The side that says, no, 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 we're not just here to live amongst the 99, but we're here for the adventure of finding a lost sheep. We're here to have something more about us. You see, Christianity is not just this sort of social means by which we have everything that we want, including a faith circle by which we feel nice and safe and comforted. comforted. But there's an adventure to it. An adventure that's, that's symbolized by and lived out by the Son of God himself, leaving the luxury of heaven and coming upon the face of this earth on the greatest adventure to give his life for us. And then he can say to the disciples, go and make disciples. What's he saying? He's he's saying, you're in a journey. You're in an adventure. That this should awaken something that we tend to suppress. And I've said it numerous times over the years that in an American Christianity that's often marked by luxury and convenience, the greatest problem, just like the book of Amos, We become so consumed with keeping that which keeps us comfortable that we fail to see that we're on the greatest adventure and the greatest mission to reach a world for Jesus Christ. For Jesus and his disciples, this life is not for for the baggins, but for the took. This isn't simply about what will make these days pass, but what what is it that makes these days worth living at all? It's not about just just what gets me through, but it's why am I here? What is this adventure that Jesus has me on? See, when Jesus says to this woman, go now and leave your life of sin, he understands that in one sense, there's the opportunity to simply make this all internal, make this all about me. That's the life of sin. But Jesus does what? He tells her to go, to run, to get to something else, to make life the center of life, the seed of life, to be something other than that which just makes me happy. To reach lost sheep. The next two weeks we have opportunities to reach lost sheep. To reach them in the outdoor pantry. To say to them by handing them food, we love you. We care about you. And deep down what you need mostly is not just a meal, but it's to have a relationship with this God who has not written you off. To look at little kids and say, this can be a place for you to feel safe. To have not just a good time once a year at an Easter egg hunt, but on every Sunday and and on Thursday nights to come out and and be in this environment where you just loved like crazy and you're guided in life. This is why we do what we do because we're, we're getting into the adventure sort of life that we're living to awaken the desire not to suppress it, to reach lost sheep. So I, I want to give you two reasons, and, and we'll give challenges along with each one, but two reasons that you should awaken your sense of adventure and follow after Jesus Christ and, and joining his mission to help lost sheep find their way home. Uh, the first one is that you, leave, you are leaving a life that drains for a life that overflows. You're leaving a life that drains for a life that overflows. That's that's been part of my big argument here, is that sin just drains you. It drains you of the joy. It drains you of desire. It drains you of compassion. It it just drains you of care and consideration for others because because it's all internalized. It's It's all put back towards me. And Jesus is saying to this woman, go and leave a life of sin. Leave it. Leave that which drains and go to that which fills and overflows. There's a scene in heaven, isn't there, in the parable? There's a scene, and Jesus sort of just naturally, beautifully flows from, from, from a shepherd rejoicing to, to heaven itself, just overflowing with this joyful sound. I was watching some of the NCAA basketball tournament, and, and afterwards, uh, or uh, during one of like the, the pregame pregame press conferences, they were talking about the coach's, his, his message to his, his team, this underdog situation, like, you guys can win. And he talked about this. He said, he said, I want you to pursue the sound of winning. You know, the sound of a locker room just being exuberant and joyful. He said, chase after the sound of winning. 
That's what Jesus says. There's going to be a sound of winning one day where heaven itself will rejoice over a lost sinner that you very well may, may, very, well, may excuse me, very well may have had a key integral role in bringing and leading that person back. What do you want to hear? Do you want to hear the sound of comfort? The sound of certainty? Or the sound of winning? You leave a life that drains for a life that overflows. It's, it's all about overflowing. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you, catch that, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Spirit. John 10, 10, the thief comes to, to steal, kill, and destroy. That's, that's the drain. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. To leave a life of drains for a life that overflows. So here's the challenge with that that you'd have a passion to overflow your row. Now, at the end of the day, I don't really care if you lead somebody to Jesus Christ and they go to a different church. I don't really care about that. But the idea is that you, you have a passion for people sitting next to you that weren't sitting anywhere before because they came to believe in Jesus Christ. We got a guy who comes here who in the past year who's invited, any, who's invited more people to church than I've seen anybody else in their entire life in the past year. And, and I look at that and I go, wow, why, like, why is that not me? What is it that he has? He's got a passion. And he sees the need. Let us see the need. You, you work with people. You have people who are your neighbors that are God-designed neighbors. Acts chapter 17. They, God determined the places where they live. You're there for a reason. They're there for a reason. How cool would it be if they were sitting right next to you, singing songs about Jesus Christ for a lost sheep to come home? When you hand that box of food out in, in, in a week, maybe that's the first step back. Maybe that's the first time they'd even consider that, that they could enter a place and not be judged. Overflow your row. Second reason I, I want you to awaken the sense of adventure in you is because, quite honestly, it's our turn to run. It's, it's our turn to run. And the Scripture uses this metaphor to talk about the adventure, the journey, the, the mission that we're called to. In Acts 20 and verse 24, the Scriptures say, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's it. That's my only aim. That's the race that I run in. In Galatians, Paul writes about how that kind of got interrupted. He says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? It's a race. It's, it's not about just sitting there and watching others run. It's not about the pastor run. It's not about the staff running. It's not about the elder board running. It's about all of us in this race. It, it's like, it, it's, it's really, it's like a relay race. And the generation before us, the generation that thought that we needed a church in this location, and, and they raised the money and they took the, the efforts to, to build this building so that we could be here to reach this community, they handed the baton off to us. And it's our turn to run. It's not our turn to let the baton fall. It's not our turn to just kind of casually walk along. No, it's our turn to run. Don't let other things cut in to keep you from, from running. This is, look, this is what we're saved to do. In The Hobbit, you get this sort of picture as he, he goes on where, where you see that when he gets taste of what an adventure is, it changes him deeply. And the old home and all the luxury and all the safety just, just could never satisfy him the way that this does. Here's the challenge with, with our turn to run. That we expect to see the work has already begun. And it's sort of an odd challenge. Most of them are like, do things. This is, this is a faith thing. 
One of our values is we expect God to do great things because he always has it. We would live with a sort of forward expectation that where I go, God has already been there first. There's this scene in, in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus is sending out 72 of his followers to go preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And he's telling them about how to do this and, and what they should expect. And one of the things that they should expect is that when they go, God has already gotten there before them. And he says this in Luke chapter 10 and verse 6. And he says, if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. What, what is a son of peace? What is the son of peace? It's a person that's already been receptive to some of God's work in their life. It's a person where God has already laid the groundwork there. You, you got to live with this expectation that when we do the outdoor pantry, when we do the Easter egg hunt, when you go to work, when you, when you have a minute to chat with a neighbor, you've got to understand that the groundwork has already been tilled by God himself. How, how do you know what a person of peace is like? Well, in Luke 10, they're interested in the message. They're open to a conversation. They're searching for something more in life. How do you know that if you don't start the conversation? You don't. I mean, maybe once in a while, but, but we've got to open the door for that conversation. For us to expect that God has already begun a work. He's already begun to, to show them how draining and emptying a life of sin is. And that there's a shepherd who looks for them, who searches passionately. C.S. Lewis, one of the most influential Christian authors to have ever written, he talks about how God pursued him. He talked about it as the, the hound of heaven. God just kept after him and kept after him and kept after him. Why might that not be your neighbor? Is it impossible that that's your aunt or your uncle? Or maybe God is after them as well. We've got to look for people of peace. We've got to look for people where God has already been at work. But you're not going to work. You're not going to look if your heart is not invested in this mission if you let the bag inside win. And this just becomes about comfort and safety and certainty. I was at uh, one of my kids' sports practices the other night, and uh, they, they were talking, uh, they were doing a game to just like, like, let the kids have some fun. They, they played a game that I was like super familiar with because all my years in youth ministry as a kid, as, in, in kids' ministry, we played this game. Uh, it's called Steal the Bacon. Steal the bacon. Maybe if you've ever done anything in, in kids' ministry, you've played the game, steal the bacon. Steal the bacon, you've got like, you, you got 20 people, you divide them in half, and you number one through 10, and you assign a number, one, two, three, four, uh, you know, to each of the teams, and you put something in the middle, and you, you call like one, and then the ones from both sides got to run out, and they got to grab uh, whatever's in the middle, which I was always disappointed with, was, was never, despite the name, was never actually bacon. I'm like, this is, this is like the pinnacle of false advertising. You call the game, steal the bacon, but there is no bacon to be stolen. And so I was always disappointed. I never liked the game. But the game was always about like two kids running out, grabbing something to try and take it back to their side. There's a side of you that could just pass life in absolute luxury and safety and certainty. And Satan could steal your heart back to his side. Or there's a battle where, where Jesus can grab that and he can run it back and he can say, yeah, you're, you're on my side of this. We're going to live out not the Baggins comfort side. We're going to live out a life of just passion for people to know their Savior. And you're going to help sheep find their shepherd. Who gets to steal your heart? Because the mission tells you your answer. Let's pray. Our Father God, I pray that the passion with which you sought us after, the people that you put into position in our lives, and the way that you line things up so that, that we would just turn to you is a mission, an adventure that every one of us would sign up for. 
I pray that you take our heart. Lord, I think of this scene where, where the religious elite are looking at these people with disdain. And you're looking at them with love. Man, Lord, I pray that we'd look at people with love. Amen.